I feel incredibly privileged to be here. I also feel a little bit like an imposter because I am absolutely not a paleoanthropologist. But again, I'm privileged to be here to speak on behalf of my, my primate friends um, about uh, how primate research has influenced and been influenced by Lucy. And for all the reasons that my colleagues have so eloquently expressed, Lucy was uh, such an amazing discovery in the sense that, that she was kind of um, everything people hoped they would find but didn't yet know how to understand. Um, and while the immediate interest was all about her adaptations for bipedalism, uh, her discovery, along with the discovery of the, the footprints at Lytoli just a few years later, really called in some new questions about what kind of social world Lucy would have lived in. Um, and the, the applicability of primates and particularly the great apes for, for trying to reconstruct some aspects of human evolution probably dates back to Darwin or even before, where he was really interested in how African apes could help us understand the origins of our own species in Africa. But through the first half or more of the, the uh, 20th century, um, people were primarily interested in the morphology of other primates and how they compared to what they were seeing in the fossil record. So they were effectively looking at the bodies of primates that had been collected in the wild. But these did lead to important insights that would have allowed uh, Don Johansson to, to understand that what he was seeing in the ground at Hadar was a primate uh, and a very unusual one. Um, but for the most part, people were um, not that interested in the natural behavior of primates for quite a while. There were some exceptions, like Clarence Ray Carpenter, who became fascinated with the vocalizations of gibbons. Uh, here, here he is with um, some recording equipment in Borneo in the 1930s. Um, and then there was, um, around the same time, Sherry Washburn, who began to observe the natural behavior of primates uh, while he was out collecting specimens throughout the world. Um, and he then integrated the systematic study of primate behavior into his vision for what he called the new physical anthropology in 1951. And this was to be not just about classifying things and measuring them, but understanding humans and our ancestors as adaptive complexes uh, full of, uh, of integrated biological and behavioral traits. And after that, there was a trickle and then a flood of, of folks going out to study primates in the wild and observe their natural behavior. So in the 60s and early 70s, then, we began to see the first texts on primate social behavior. And of course, the most um, prominent, perhaps, of these individuals at the time was Jane Goodall, who was commissioned by Louis Leakey to go out to study um, wild chimpanzees in Tanzania. Um, and Leakey was motivated by what he saw as a key missing piece in his search for human origins in the fossil record, which is that fossils don't contain a whole lot of clues to the behavior of our ancestors. And Goodall's studies paid off really quickly. By the mid-60s, she had observed chimpanzees using tools to, to fish for termites. This challenged the notion of man the toolmaker. Uh, she had observed chimpanzees working in a group to hunt for monkeys. And in 1974, the year that Lucy was discovered, she had begun to observe what became a years-long rift and eventual split of her study community that, that revealed for the first time that chimpanzees, like humans, engage in lethal warfare. So, by uh, the discovery of Lucy, there, Lucy, there was already a, a real momentum in primate field studies to understand how these, pri these species think and behave and interact with their environment. And effectively, we see the adolescence of both the fields of primatology and paleoanthropology coming together. And then over the subsequent years, the field of primatology has itself evolved and adopted a wide range of interdisciplinary tools that help us do a better job of measuring behavior, of analyzing it, and of understanding the ways that environments directly impact individual biology. 
Primatology in the 80s and 90s uh, began to document and develop explanatory models that explain the diverse patterns of social behavior exhibited by primates around the world. And, and one of the big lessons from the, these studies is that social groups are adaptive solutions that allow organisms to tackle a wide range of ecological challenges. And that primate groups in particular aren't just aggregations for moving around or for safety, but they're a complex web of individual relationships and strategies. And so it's this kind of work that makes it impossible to think about our human adaptations without considering the social environment that influenced them. So as an example, in a lot of ways, this, this work helped us defy the supposition of Leakey that behavior can't fossilize. Um, so in work that was led by John Matani, who's here today, um, looking at a wide range of variation in primate social behavior patterns, life history patterns, and morphology, we learned that sexual dimorphism in canine size and body size results from sexual selection on, on male competition. So particularly when there aren't many breeding opportunities to go around. Um, and it's these studies that help us uh, identify some of the candidate uh, breeding systems that, that would be associated with uh, dimorphic species in the fossil record. Baboons have long been a primate species of a group of species of particular interest because, like hominids, hominins, they, they um, evolve from forest living ancestors, but can also be found in a wide range of relatively open habitats and have spread throughout Africa. One of the lessons that primates have to tell, or that baboons have to tell us, is that this kind of ecological adaptability equates to just a lot of variation in social behavior and group structures, uh, even among some of these species that are so closely related to one another that they can interbreed with one another. And a lot of these baboon groups have very complex uh, underlying structures. So for example, we see some um, multi-level societies in baboons, and we see some structures where you have pair bonds within larger groups. Um, and it has been suggested that some of these social systems may more closely resemble some of the, the things that may have occurred in Australopithecines than the, the social systems we see in are more closely related species. And the decades of research with baboons has also helped us understand that just as group living is an adaptive uh, way to deal with ecological problems, it creates a vast new set of complex problems around navigating interactions with the other individuals in your social group. Um, and it appears that these kinds of, of pressures would have led uh, to uh, the evolution of some aspects of complex cognition. So in these monkeys, we are seeing for the first time, not only are they able to, um, to, to negotiate the relationships with multiple other individuals in their groups, but they actually monitor and understand the relationships between others where they're not directly involved, and they can use that information to modify their own behavior. Now, the great apes, and, and particularly at the African great apes, have long held special significance as the living species that are most closely related to humans. Um, and we would grapple over many years with what exactly does this mean? So in the 80s, a paleoanthropologist David Pilbeam and primatologist Richard Wrangham described the African great apes as time machines. Uh, they're basically saying that the, the traits that are shared across these species uh, would likely have been features of the last common ancestor of all of the apes. Um, and these are species that are uh, primarily, oh, I'm missing some, yeah, okay. <laughs> I can't see my icons here, but they, they uh, are primarily living uh, in rainforest environments, so they had adaptations uh, that for spending lots of time in the trees, but they could also move comfortably for long distances on the ground. Um, from studying the diets of these species, we can infer uh, that, that the apes in general have a desire to eat ripe fruit if they can find it, um, which means that in order to feed their large bodies and brains, they were seeking out a very high quality resource, but a resource that is not consistently available in time and space. 
Um, so when we look at these species, some of the differences between them, uh, things like uh, the, the huge jaw muscles and the specialized guts of the gorillas, the um, slow metabolic rates and enhanced ability to get fat in orangutans, and the flexible fission fusion social systems in chimpanzees and bonobos. These are all different adaptive solutions to the problem of what do you do when there's not enough high quality food available. But as in the baboon example, there's a kind of a frustrating array of different types of social organizations in the apes. So it wasn't until um, the late 1990s, really, that um, genetic methods had definitively pinned down uh, that uh, the, um, the chimpanzees and the bonobos, the two species of pan, were the species most closely related to humans and more closely related to us than they are to gorillas. And this allowed us to think about a very different animal, not the last common ancestor of all of the apes, but the last common ancestor of uh, the humans and chimpanzees living around six to eight million years ago. But what would these chimpanzees have looked like? Um, that's been a, a big puzzle because for all of the similarities that these two species have in their size, their appearance, uh, their basic social structure, their diet, they have some remarkable behavioral differences. Chimpanzees, um, are, their social networks are essentially networks of cooperative relationships among males. Males physically dominate females. They fight vigorously amongst themselves for social status. And they exhibit the kind of hostility towards other groups um, that is more deadly than any other primate except for ourselves. Meanwhile, in bonobos, females frequently hold the power and cooperate with one another. Tensions are as likely to be mediated through sex as through fighting, um, and we've observed peaceful interactions between groups. So in some ways, we know that bonobos are kind of oddballs. Uh, they likely evolved from a geographically isolated population of chimpanzees, and they show some unusual patterns of development that lead to differences in their morphology, but perhaps also differences in, in the behavior. But given everything that we've learned about primate social flexibility so far, I don't think it's really easy to identify that a, a, a less common ancestor would have been more like one of these uh, than the other, or that any of the, the behaviors we observe wouldn't have possibly occurred in those ancestors. And now genomic data tells us that there are small regions of the human genome that we share only with chimpanzees, and also small regions that we share only with bonobos, that they don't share with each other, which makes this even more likely. So as a group, the, the hominids are perhaps best defined not by their morphology or their social characteristics, but by their unusual life histories. And these great apes take a big step away from the monkeys and towards humans uh, in the, the features of their life course. So they all can live past the age of 40 years in the wild. Chimpanzees can live past the age of 60. And they take about 15 years to grow up. And the A pattern of development is not just elongated, but it, it appears to be fundamentally different than what we see in other primates. Um, so for example, in other primates, weaning infants off of breast milk occurs quite abruptly um, and, um, and, and quickly leads to a transition to um, adulthood. Uh, whereas in apes, this process takes place over many years, um, during which time breast milk may just be a supplement um, against ecological instability. And, and this kind of disconnection then between the nutritional dependence of offspring and the greater dependence of offspring on mothers that we see in the apes uh, fundamentally changes uh, things like birth spacing, for example. Um, it also annoyingly means that for paleoanthropologists, it's harder to infer things about development from uh, the teeth of these fossil hominids. Apes also exhibit um, some key physiological and behavioral hallmarks that are otherwise uniquely associated with human childhood. And this is a particular period of life that's associated with social development and particularly with social learning. 
Um, and chimpanzee mothers provide uh, mo a model for learning essential foraging skills, but they are also known, for example, uh, to play with their infants in a way that we don't see in, in a lot of other species of mammal. Um, enhanced ca capacity for social learning then appears to be a, a real next step in cognitive evolution of species. Um, and what's unusual then is that, that these um, apes are not just, um, thank you, they, the apes are um, not just learning from their mothers, they're learning from other individuals, and they don't stop learning when they become adults. So while chimpanzees exhibit a, a wide range, dozens now of cultural uh, behaviors, these are behavioral variations across populations that can't be explained by their genetics or their ecology, but by a process of innovation followed by social, social transmission of behavior. And when I look at these uh, cultural behaviors in chimps, I, I always think, well, a lot of them are kind of silly. <laughs> they're, they're of relatively minor significance to the daily lives of these animals, and yet they are indicative of an underlying process that probably has much greater significance to how these animals uh, grow and behave. So for example, in both experimental tasks in captivity and in naturalistic settings like group hunting in chimpanzees, we see that individuals learn and identify which other individuals are the most effective collaborators. And they perform differently when they have access to these collaborators. So this is affecting their decision making. And interestingly, we see a package of similar traits in a distantly related uh, group of species, the capuchins that live in the neotropics. Uh, they also have large brains. They also have relatively prolonged development compared to their closest relatives. They have a high number of culturally transmitted behaviors, um, and they seem to have some advanced cognitive skill sets that help them cooperate effectively. Um, including perhaps a sense of fairness. So over um, one of the key conclusions that, that we may be able to derive over 50 years and more of primate uh, social studies is that social systems and social behavior are evolutionarily quite malleable. Um, so are we going to be able to say definitively what kind of social organization any particular ancestor uh, would, have, would have lived in? I think probably not. I think that would be very difficult to do. But we have a better idea about how these animals might have thought about their social world, and we have an idea of the key drivers, uh, like competition and cooperation, that would have enabled uh, subsequent behavioral evolution. Um, and these studies tell us that the social units of these species and the social brains uh, would have been really the critical component for success as early hominids moved out into different kinds of environments. So before I end, as a last thought, I wanted to highlight one of the, the key things that's happening now in primate research, um, which is uh, kind of building off of something that's been discovered in the medical literature, which is that our social worlds have as large an impact on our health as do things like smoking or obesity. Things like social inequality and the availability of strong social support networks have profound effects on health in humans and in other primates. But in humans, the problem is that we have a really hard time digging into this phenomenon because we basically just have to ask people about their social life or their income, et cetera. Um, and here are primatologists who've been systematically observing the social behavior and relationships of primates for many decades in great detail and have the kind of data that human biologists could only dream of. And so now it's, it's primatologists making key discoveries in this area about how social processes affect biological mechanisms that affect our health. So the point I want to make here is that this field that grew out of the quest to understand uh, and reconstruct our past is now having important impacts in shaping our healthy futures. So I want to thank you for your attention today. And again, thank you to the Institute of Human Origins uh, for, for inviting me to speak today. <laughs>